So I was sitting in the backyard of my friend Eric's house. We were drinking iced tea late in the afternoon, fall. And we were watching our daughters, both of our daughters, about eight years old at this time. On the other side of this sort of a split rail fence is a hundred acres of meadow. It's sort of at the bottom of the valley in which I, I live. And our daughters had snuck under the fence and they were kind of running around playing in this meadow. And my friend and I are talking and all of a sudden my wife peeks her head out of the door of, of uh, Eric's house and says, hey, how are the girls doing? And Eric and I turn to, to look in the field. We can't spot them at first. And then sort of both of us at the same time, sort of looking way back in this hundred acre field, we see two horses kind of riding across the grass and our daughters are each on a horse. Now, Eric doesn't own horses. I don't own horses and our kids have no horse riding skills. So this sort of simultaneous panic happens to both of us. And we both turn to my wife and say, they're fine, they're fine. And we wait for my wife to go in and then we do the sort of middle-aged man scramble. We, we, we get under the fence and we're running as fast as we can across this field to try to figure out what's going on with the daughters that we were supposed to be watching. We, as we get close, we notice there's a little clump of oak trees that's kind of shadowed in there. And there's a woman uh, standing in these oak trees and she's, she's talking to the girls and telling them what to do with the horses. And there's a little trail kind of uh, that somebody had mowed in, in this meadow and the horses are following this trail. And so we run sort of out of breath and say, hey, hey, these are our daughters, you know? And she's like, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. These are really safe horses you know, they're going to be okay. And I'm like, what's going on out here? And this woman says, well, I, I'm a horse therapist. And uh, I, I rescue abused horses, and I bring them down to this field to sort of rehabilitate them. And, and these two are just about done. They're really great with kids. And I said, okay. And I was like, what do you mean a horse therapist? And she said, well, People buy horses, they can't afford to feed them or they go through hard times and so they can't get rid of them. And so sometimes they lock them up in dark spaces. And she said, sometimes you'll have a horse, its whole life, it's stuck in a garage or, or in some dark enclosure. And those horses will be kept there uh, from when they're born and fed sort of like tepid water that's in, a, uh, in, in some metal container and dry oats and half starved. And then either we'll be given this horse or someone will tell us about it. We'll go rescue this horse. And I said, well, well what's that like when you, when you get one of these horses? How do you rehabilitate it? And she said, well, the first thing, you know, I got to get it in my trailer. And it cries and screams and resists. It wants to stay in that dark enclosure because that's all it's known. And then I got to bring it down to this field. And she said, it's really interesting. When I get it down to this field, it doesn't recognize the creek back here as water doesn't have the same smell, especially if it's had tepid water just sort of in these metal containers. It doesn't recognize grass as food. And so the horse will, will cry out for food and cry for water. And I'll bring it and sort of drag it down to this creek. And it might even stand in the creek and it won't drink because it doesn't know what this is. And I'll have it in the field and it won't eat because it doesn't know what this is until eventually it gets so hungry or so thirsty it'll put its head down in this creek water and it'll drink and then it'll realize, wow, this is water. And a little bit later over time, sometimes it takes two days, it will reach down and grab some of this grass and it'll realize this is food. And I said, well, what happens when it gets to that point? And she said, well, that's my favorite part. As soon as it recognized that, that it's in a field of food, that there's all this flowing water, what the horse will do is run, is run. Circles around that field, jumping and kicking, recognizing it's in a world of food and water and it's free. Now that's our work, right? Is to free the prisoners. And it's difficult because we are also in the prison system. <laughs> so we're trying to find a way to, to free young people. And we're in a culture that trains us to no longer hear, to no longer hear. We're, we're trained to, to deafen our ears to the presence of God. We're, we're trained to, to, to close and repress uh, the sounds 
of those crying around us. We're, we're our, our own comp compassion squashed. We're trained to not hear the, the, the still small voice within us that's longing for us to um, flourish into who we were created to be. So, so there's sort of a trained deafness. We're stuck in those dark garages uh, with tepid water, with, 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 with flavorless food. And this is the world that our young people grow into. They grow into a world that is a sort of rampant loneliness that is filled with anxiety and depression. We all know this. And one of the stances that we're trying to create in young people is this stance of, of listening, of, of, of being present, of being curious, of pointing our, uh, the ears of our hearts in the direction uh, of God. 